people are human beings for the first time. Because our image throughout the world was of Arabs as terrorists and Muslims being mad. And that was the image that the media had before. But the way in which the Arab revolutions made Arab people human, and it would never have happened without social media. It would never, never have happened without social media. So when Muhammad uh, Bouazizi in, in Tunisia, he was, a, he was a street vendor, but he, he was selling vegetables on the side of the road. But he had a degree and he couldn't find a job, and the police were demanding bribes, and all sorts of things terrible happened to him. And eventually, he just had enough, and he set himself alight, and he burnt to death. And there was an uprising in Tunisia. And within a month or so, they had got rid of one of the worst dictators in Africa. The people just got angry, because Tunisia had helped America torture people in their country. They, they killed people. They, in detention, there was no free press. Uh, the leader was in power for 30 years or out, and, and, and so on. But as this happened, Tunisia is a small Arab country. But with, and that started in December 2010. But what then happened is this shifted to Egypt. And in Egypt, a different thing happened. There was a man called Khalid, uh, Khalid Saeed. I keep on forgetting his name. Khalid Saeed. And I really believe that Ndifuna Kwasi needs to do a Khalid Saeed lecture every year uh, in which we talk about social media. And, and what happened to that man is the police beat him to death. And someone captured it on their cell phone. And they put that onto the media. They put it onto the web. And everyone saw it. Now what had happened two or three years before in Egypt is there was a workers' campaign. Now you'll remember that Egypt is the largest Arab country in Middle East and North Africa. It's the largest Arab country with over 80 million people. And in Egypt, they had the worst of the Arab dictators, Mubarak. And he's the worst in the sense that he gets a billion dollars a year. He used to get a billion dollars a year from the Americans to maintain dictatorship and control over his people because Egypt supported Israel. So Mubarak put loads and loads and loads of people in jail. He banned the Muslim Brotherhood. The only political party that really was allowed to exist was the National Democratic Party, which was his party. Uh, he'd been in power for 30 years and so on. So when Khalid uh, Saeed died, or was killed, uh, there was a group called the April 6 Movement. And a young girl from the April 6 Movement developed, a, I can't remember her name now, she did a, a personal appeal, a video appeal on Facebook. And she put it up on Facebook. And at the same time, the head of Google in Egypt, Wail Ghanim, he put up a uh, he put up a page, a, fa a, Google, a Facebook page, we are all Khalid Saeed. And that page has millions and millions and millions of likes. And it became the place for starting, when they said they're starting a, a, a they're going to have a demonstration on the 25th of January in 2011, they expected a couple of hundred, maybe a thousand people to come to the demonstration because they get beaten very badly, they get put in jail, they get tortured and so on. And 10,000 people came. And the police reacted badly. And the next day, 100,000 people came. And the way they distrib distributed their messages, this was, young, this was young people organizing. And the way in which they distributed their messages was through their cell phone, through Facebook, through Twitter, um, that, those were the main ones, huh? Cell phone messages, text, e SMSs, Facebook, and Twitter. Now I'm going to give you some statistics about, about this, and, and this data comes from a report called the 
Arab Media Influence Report, or AMIR 2011. And just to give you an idea, the Middle East and North Africa has 65 million internet users. 65 million, right? That's, um, that means uh, a part of Southern Africa, almost everyone, is on the internet in the Middle East and in North Af Africa. No, not everyone there is on, on the internet, but it means if you imagine South Africa, everyone in South Africa is on the internet. That would be the idea. 80 million they expect by 2012. That's now. 30.8% of the population, 30.8% of the population is on the internet, and it's higher than the global average, which is 20, 20, just about 28, 29%. Their user growth between 2000 and 2010 went up by 1,000%. And in the Middle East and North Africa, there are 17 million Facebook users. And one of the things to remember is that the fastest growing language on Facebook is Arabic. So the fastest growing la language on, on Facebook is, is Arabic. Now what happened? You must remember that Twitter, Facebook and all these things can be used for all that sex talk that goes on, the girlfriends that you talk about, and so on. So that's all the conversation that goes on. And like everyone tells me when they've gone to church, and then the next day they drink themselves to a stupor, and so on. So, you know, you like uh, I, I have some friends who, who tell me how drunk they get, and then they tell me they've been to church. Uh, so so, so, so that, that's how people use the internet. But what essentially happened is that there's good and bad that you can do with the internet and, and social media generally. And Alex gave a very good thing of how people can use it badly. You can use it badly, but the very important thing to remember is you can use it for evolution and for change, but you can also use it. It can also be used to repress, to watch, and so on. So the internet, the CIA monitored all the tw tweets that were coming out of Egypt, as did this marketing company, uh, they both did it. And the CIA wanted to see, of course, what, what was going on. But this Egyptian company, or this Middle East company that did it, all looked at 10 million, the 10 million Twitter and Facebook conversations every day in the Middle East and North Africa. And they monitored those 10 million for a month or three, a period of three months. And what they found is that in January when the Egyptian revolution began, there were 1.6 million people talking about Egypt across the Middle East and North Africa. Or sending messages or say, come, go to this or go to that or go to the next thing. And by February, that had doubled to 3.3 million people talking about. So in one month, the number of conversations on the internet about Egypt and its revolt doubled. Now, I'd explain to you what, what, what happened uh, in, in relation to Khalid Saeed, but let me, let me make two other points before I, 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 I speak about how they monitored and how this changed. In 2010, 57% of conversation among Arab people 57% of conversation on the internet was about salary, income, jobs, minimum wage. They were all socioeconomic. Housing, corruption, and police brutality. So the political conversation on Twitter and so on in the Middle East in 2010 was all about social and economic grievances. In 2011, the political conversation became corruption, Mubarak, Minister, National Democratic Party, Parliament, Freedom and Revolution. That is what the conversation became changed into. So 80% of conversations in 2011 that mentioned Egypt, 80% of them started mentioning revolution change and getting rid of Mubarak. And that shows you how powerful the, the, the media can be. Now I'm going to ask a question. How many of you, how many of you are on Mixit here? 
Yeah. Mixit is the single largest platform in Africa. Single largest platform in Africa, and it's a South African created thing, which we really need to also take se seriously. When, but, but we can come back to that. Two points about the Arab Revolution. Two points about it is it was led by young people. And in Egypt, when the elections came, now you, you have to know Egypt is a country with 80 million people and about 30 million people voted. In the elections, only 1 million people voted for revolutionary change. 29 million people voted against the revolutionary parties. They voted for the Muslim Brotherhood and they voted for the very reactionary Islamists called the Salafists. And now the Twitter conversations are shifting to how do we stop the Brotherhood or how do we stop the Salafists and so on. But what that shows us is that it is not enough to, because the Twitter class, and I use that very, very advisedly in Facebook class, was mainly young middle class people. They were not the kids in the slums. The kids in the slums got their message through the mosque. So, uh, as Alex pointed out, your, your, your campaign should never have only one area of focus. It shouldn't only be on Twitter. It shouldn't only be on Facebook. It shouldn't only be in the city. Um, it should be as far to diff on different platforms, but most importantly, I'm going back now to old days in revolution, and, and then I'm going to go to current days. How many minutes do I have? Three? Five. Five. <laughs> okay, so the first, the first place I want to start is that not many of you would know the name Lenin or the name uh, Kautsky or even the name Marx, Karl Marx. But it was indispensable for the modern socialist movement to have newspapers. Indispensable. The German Social Democratic Party, which is now the Socialist Party of Germany, GD, uh, SDP, the Socialist Party in Germany, was the most powerful social democratic party. And in the, in the 90, between 1890 and 1914, they had over 200 daily newspapers, 200 daily newspapers, which went to trade union members, to women, across Germany. So it meant that in those days, the real form that we used was media and, of course, mass meetings. Enormous amount of mass meetings and, and smaller meetings and so on. Lenin wrote a book called What is to be Done? And that book is are very often derided. But one of the most important messages he gives you in that book is the possibility, the way in which a newspaper is used as an organizer. How when every one of us writes about our experience and what we see and how to do investigation and showing a policeman taking a bribe, showing someone being necklaced, and, and so on, we do our own investigations on those things. And we all contribute to social media or to a newspaper. Then we all fall part of it and more people read it because there are many voices in it. So that's, that's, that's just the tradition of, of, of all of this. I see the killers is much more interesting. Than this uh, and I prefer Bob Dylan though. <laughs> and who is that one? I think it's great. <laughs> all right. Um, one minute. One minute. I just want to give you an ex example of TAC. In the, in the early days of TAC, and I want to come back to the question of giving money. In the early days of TAC, we made posters that we cut out of newspapers and we put it up, and Dina and other people here will be able to tell you that. But we were the first organization in the country in, in, in the late 90s to use email as a newsletter, to use an email newsletter, to send out every week we send out an email newsletter. And so people, not only in South Africa, 
Because what you must remember about the Arab revolutions and about HIV is that they created global communities and CONI. They create global communities. They don't only create local communities, they also create global communities. So when you use your social media, you must understand that it goes beyond you. And through that you're creating a community. And when TAC started, that's what we did. And he's not here, but Nathan Geffen set up our first website. And he took over the internet newsletter. But you'll never forget that TAC was a lot more than an internet news newsletter and a great website. We also had songs that we sang. We, we developed a CD. We had our t-shirt, which is something we should have sold from day one. If we did that, 60 rand a t-shirt these days. You sell it, I hope. Okay, so I need to buy a new one. Um, so, we made our t-shirt. That t-shirt, my favorite HIV positive t-shirt, is not one that was made in South Africa. It was one made in a place called Nepal, which is a small kingdom in the Himalayas, near India and all those funny places. And it was hand embroidered HIV positive and a, a picture of the world on, on it behind. Now it shows you the power of photographs, the power of social media, the power of the media. And today, we face a very dangerous situation in South Africa. We face the malemaization of our politics, where people think stupidly, they act stupidly, and it's not only malema, it's also people who talk with us as refugees. And that means that there's a very dangerous discourse being created in our country which is, will divide people. And the danger is that a lot of that happens on the internet. In Talkback, on Facebook, you'll see the most horrible things. One of the biggest South African sites on face, pages on Facebook is the Osei Africa, as an example. So, what we need to look at is ways of bringing conversation to people that is knowledge-based, that shows how we can change society in a way that is positive, that gives people more knowledge, so that people don't only act on the emotion of Joseph Kony, but they act on the basis of the knowledge, which what, as Alex showed us very clearly, Joseph Kony, the story was gone. There was no knowledge behind it. There was a fake story, or not a fake story, a, a story that was very powerful, but 10 years late. Thank you. Thanks very much, Saki. We're going to open the floor now, and I think the best thing to do is to take three questions at a time, and you can direct your questions either to Alex or to Zaki. Um, so, does anyone have a question? Mm. Got one in the back there. There's one, two, three. I don't think it's a, it's a question, but I would like to have a challenge based on what is happening currently in South Africa in terms of the CPTV. So there's engagement around that, and there's caucus around that. I'm wondering about the social networks communication and how they're going to monitor in terms of the CIA. Because I remember last time that yes, there was not very commission. What happened to the Commission if now we're going to amend or adapt to the CPTP? How is it going to influence the way we want to mobilize and organize on the ground? And in terms of this technology, you know, how the issues is to a normal woman? Because now we are facing a really weather patterns, you know, we are facing a really crisis. You know? So how do we look at the issue of coal and nuclear? You know? and Really, uh, in terms of marketing, you know, does marketing also speculate or articulate the, the dangers of advertising, like Giorgio, etc.? Because we find out one of the, most of the workers, all the working class, are working in those factories, you know, they're underpaid. And then at the end of the month, they can't even buy the money that they receive from the company that they're working for to buy.
buy the same product. So I just want to open up a debate like that so that we can see how the social internet works and also the work that, that we need and how we treat it to the global warming and also other issues of sustainability. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll, let's take a yeah, few. Is there any others? I saw some hands. I can't hear, so can you hear the mic? No, you can. Just a bit louder. Oh, access to the information from the seminar, the access to the email or newsletter or something of that nature. Okay. Yes. I have a question. Um, how would you, um, I guess it's to, it's, it's to Alex. Okay. So Zach, he was saying that uh, Coney wasn't knowledge based anymore. Well, how do we build campaigns that are knowledge based? But very clearly, what you said in your your uh, presentation, which has also been my experience as somebody who you know, works in this space, is that most people make decisions on an emotional basis and are not rational. So how would you how would you reconcile those two things? And then, and then secondly, how would you use that for, for campaigns? How would you how would you apply that to the kinds of issues that we deal with? You know, that people education might deal with or SJC might deal with. Let's see if there are more. I think there were some more. I know I saw, yeah, Cynthia. Yeah, uh, my question is uh, Can we see you? To, to Alex. Uh, okay. We can't see you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wonder uh, uh, how do you see us as a position as we do social media? Uh, how do you play us as a position? the whole world is a very efficient communication system and we've got papers and we've got blogs and, and we we're kind of pro at um, selling ideas and kind of creating propaganda and making it happen but it wasn't always like that and if you look at where communication developed and started and by that I include graphic design which is a part of our everyday life everywhere it, it started with real causes it started with revolutions and it started with um, social issues and back in the day your artists and your activists work together and um, this doesn't happen anymore what's happened is that the artists have almost split from the activists and we kind of we we have it two opposite ends of, of our, our spectrum where art is something quite niche and cool and and elitist um, and activism is some, and, and superficial and activism is something on the other side, which is um, quite boring. It's boring. <laughs> it's inaccessible, and it's it's yucky. I mean, like the average person doesn't want to think about these issues because it's like it's too much, and it's not packaged properly. <coughs> um, so I would say to you, 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 we, you need to find your artists again. You need to find your writers and your designers, and and communication needs to become a priority. Um, you know, in a, in a business that sells shoes, your, your communications is an entire department because they realize that if nobody understands what you're saying, they can't. And um, they won't buy your product. So, find your artist, is <laughs> what I wanted to say. And then there was one other similar... Um, I think for an organization like this, you need to break down your messaging and package it. Um, and you need to decide who you're going to be targeting with that message for. Now, if you were to go to university and study marketing or study marketing anywhere, they would teach you these skills, but they wouldn't teach it to you in an activism sense. They wouldn't teach you how to package ideas that will that will change society and lives. They'll teach you how to package stuff. Um, I don't, sell things. To sell stuff, yeah, to sell. I don't think there's a difference, though. I mean, if you, once you understand how to sell something, you know, you immediately add an advantage because understand how to communicate with people and I think that's um, I you know I didn't know much about um, Indifuno or Quasi um, or any of your organizations until I met Greg and um, 
it's not because it's I think it's incredible. I, like I think what you guys do is amazing, but it hasn't reached me. And um, you know, I, when I went and looked for it, it's it's beautifully written and it's beautifully packaged, but it's it it hasn't yet been made accessible to a bigger market. And I think that's your challenge for any cause um, is to find the relevance for a big market. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll start off by saying that where Alex left off, um, that all our work and our messages can't reach thousands, they have to reach millions. And the way in which we do it is by cooperating. So uh, there are a number of people here, all the ones on Facebook put up your hand. Okay? All the ones on Mixit put up your hands. Right? Now, there's an important thing. When I was an activist, and we still do it today, all of us. Well, I, I'm still an activist. But when I, when I first was an activist, the most important way we communicated was with pamphlets. Right? So just to get to Pupa quickly, I think that social media is an amazing way to stop trees being cut, cut, cut down. It's a really amazing way, because many, many more people can read stuff now without having to do it on paper. We do it very cheaply and, very, and, on, and in a form that, that, that is sustainable. So I think <coughs> social media can be very, very important for a sustainable environment and, me and communication uh, program. Now, on the secrecy bill and the information bill and stuff like that, what can never happen again, and will never happen again, hopefully, if, unless we... We, and, and we can make sure that it never happens again, is that information can be kept secret by governments. That will never happen again. Because everyone has a cell phone, if you see some politician doing something wrong, you can get it sent off to someone else, and to someone else, and to someone else. You can get it on the internet. And in Egypt they tried shutting the internet down for a couple of days. But why didn't it work? Because it then means the society can't work. It really means the society can't work. The capitalists can't do their business because all business is done in electronically. The banks can't work properly. This one can't work properly. That one can't work properly. And it's gone. So they can't shut down the internet. And, or they can, but only at enormous cost to society. In Syria, we heard from an activist the other day here, in Syria, we heard from an activist the other day here. Uh, an, an, an activist who went into Syria, helped get people medicines, helped get people uh, stuff. And what, what we learned from him is they've shut in, in Homs and Hama and, and those places, they shut down the cell phone networks. But they can't stop people from getting satellite phones. And satellite phones, you don't need MTN. Vodacom and all those sorts of things for. The satellite exists outside your country. So, as far as secrecy and so on goes, the ANC security crats, secure crats can try as much as they like, but they're not going to be able to silence us. They're going to make it harder and more difficult, but they're not going to be able to silence us. I just, on the topic of secrecy, um millions of people and huge big organizations with a lot of money have tried mm -hmm. to shut down the cost of the internet many, many times. Um, the entire entertainment industry is up in arms because they can't stop piracy. Um, and, and what happens is that, um, you know, as soon as they do try and do it, there are people out there, and many, many of them, who see it as a game to work around that. And, you know, we, we have Anonymous. I don't know if you know about Anonymous. They're, they're a massive organization online, and they... Don't know each other. They, some of them know each other, yeah. but, <laughs> but the point is that they don't operate with a face because um, they are the, the, the faceless mass. And, you know, when it, they do, they've started to do kind of harmful things, like they will hack websites, they will release information, but the point that they make over and over again is that information belongs to people, and you cannot, you cannot ever shut them down. China... Um, it's a censored internet country, um, 
you know, that's, I don't know if we could ever get to that state, though. It's such a, I mean, you know, I, I, I don't, it takes a long time before we ever get to a state where we are like China, but it's, it's impossible to silence people on the internet. Good luck to anyone who tries. But like, speaking from honesty, you know, uh, from the activist element, or uh, angle, uh, in our social space, uh, post some, we post uh, something on the wall, and then we're talking about something that's very uh, radical or emotional or whatever. But you find that same activist, they don't respond to those things like that. But if you put a nice t shirt, you tell, like, I mean, love. You know, everyone, who I like, like, no, really. You know, so I just want to understand that how that impact to indigenous language we better have, so that people when they communicate these days, they don't communicate in the way that the information can, can flow, I can understand. Like, I don't understand this empty mic, so sometimes I get lost. There's a language in Facebook that I use. I don't use those things, but when I got in, then I find this kind of language. So I don't think the social networks also have a way of changing people the way they live or it's changing the language, everything that they, they, they're trying to suit, you know. I mean, you know your capitalism is there, and it's making money, and it's to suit for the masses and others to follow. But I'm trying to get the sense of this thing, because if you're a TAC activist, you write something about what NHI, National Health Insurance, what, what is their take about that? What are the engagement? We try to engage people on those, on those platforms, but we find out COVID, I'm not sure what is happening to them. Maybe their activism is away from Social, uh, the social, the the communication issues. You know, so I'm not sure. But how do we really improve? You know, the communication and the way we speak. And when I came here, you find that people are sitting on Facebook or whatever. There's a lot of books here. So what, what is that? What do you think? Social, 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 social. Okay, you're a lot out. Another two questions. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, the, I, I like the point that. Uh, we say that ANC will try to shut, uh, shut us down and the, I mean China is a censored country but then there's also another deal which has been called the submission which they call uh, general intelligence law I mean reveal I don't know how far is it going to take us how far is it going to take us because I mean there are fears that that view is going to give the secure threats the power to go into our cell phones, into our emails, into the social media. Are we not going to end up as China? Yeah. Um, so, I get that, or well, I believe that um, if you try and start a movement um, in social media uh, and it's not for the right reasons, you will eventually be found out. Um, so, something similar to what happened to the Cody. Um, my question is what if you try and start a movement with all the best intentions? Um, and that community of people that are there just to latch on to your every success to try and create success for themselves and try and change your, your, your message um, purely for themselves. How do you manage those people to make sure that your message is still getting across? Should we take, do you, yeah. take one more round of questions? I'm just your question. Yes. Is there, let's take another one. Uh, thanks, Greg. Um, I think, you know, um, thanks Alex for that presentation. Um, when, when, when we're trying to get to the biggest possible market, I think there's a, there's, you, you get to the risk of sensationalizing an issue. We saw that with Cody, we've seen it with other issues. And, you know, I mean, the last I heard of Cody was the founder running around naked in yeah. San Diego being, being arrested. Um, and we haven't heard much about it since then. So I'm just interested to hear from you if you have any examples of um, social movements or organizations that have run successful campaigns that are sustainable. I mean, one that comes to mind personally is the VARDS, yes. online petitioning yeah. site, which have done really, really amazing work um, for two, three years now. I mean, every time there's a petition out there, they get five, six million people to sign on. And that's all they do. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so I'm just interested to hear if there are any examples of organizations that have managed to build support continuously but kind of sustain that support over time. Um, I, I'll answer yours quickly. And go and have a look at Given Game. They list almost every single um, 
NGO cause online, and there are examples of more sustainable ones. Um, I think the Educate a Girl Child went viral online as well, um, and that was a but that wasn't really a, 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 an ongoing campaign. It was more a thought that they wanted to get going. Um, but yeah, you do risk, raise the risk of sensationalizing. Um, you know, you get people who are good communicators in this world and you get sensationalists. And just as there are journalists of integrity and you've got to kind of err on the side of communicating with integrity as well. Um, yeah, I mean, someone should have said, listen, Jason, just calm down. Can we actually have a reasonable discussion about this? But nobody ever did say that because he was in completely in control of it. And Shane, he, he, went, he became an overnight sensation, so he went mad. I always say there should be a course at school, which is what happens if you go viral on the internet, because it could happen <laughs> to anyone. And there's no school, you know, how do you deal with this? I, Shane, I feel sorry for you. Your question about um, how do you maintain a, a, a vision without other people leeching off your success. Um, can you be a little more specific about what you mean by that? Do you mean other people using your cause to better their own image? Yeah. I think that's, you know, you... So, so for example, yeah. people latching on to you trending on Twitter, but yes. creating, using your hashtag to create yes. their own business for themselves like that. and that kind of thing. Um, nobody's fooled by people like that. Uh, you know, I think there's what gets said online, and then there's what doesn't get said, but people watch. And I think that you, you can't worry about that. I mean, if you if your idea and your, your organization has success and integrity, um, people will avoid the spam links. Or, um, but, you know, if other people are going to help spread your thing as well, let them do it. Um, there's a statistic, something like 40% of people who are on Twitter don't actually interact. They just watch. Um, and, you know, as someone who has a bit of a profile as well, sometimes, you, you know, you people try and drag you into their stuff. They they have these these causes, and sometimes they're crazy, and then they, they kind of like ha at you in, and they hashtag you in, and they, they connect you, and they say that you said this, and you said that, and what you could do is, is stand up and be like, actually, tweet, you know, I didn't, I have nothing to do with this person, and further their, um, their little ego trip, where you can literally just say nothing and let other people watch what's happening and decide for themselves because they're the ones making the fool of themselves. You know, you you don't have to defend yourself at every point. You can see how what a bad thing Twitter is, not that what a bad, how people make fools of themselves by the way in which our Premier uses Twitter. Um, you never, the example is never get involved in an argument on these things. On Facebook it's fine because you can write more, you can write back and, you, and, and, and so on. But you yeah. cannot really explain yourself on Twitter. Twitter is just a way to share good pictures, um, good articles and, 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 and a one-liner. But never engage yeah. because otherwise you drive yourself crazy and you drive the world crazy. So, <laughs> so that's, that's, that's one thing I, I, would, I, would, I would say. But it, it is a difficult thing where people latch onto movements. And so on, but you, you can't do. There's very little. The part, that, the price we pay for for freedom, is that we have the good and the bad of freedom, and that's the price we we pay for freedom. And that brings me back to things like the intelligence ball and and, and, and so on. You know, there's such a bad group of a uh, bunch of legislation. I think one of the things that we should do is have a political seminar to discuss what is the meaning of having the traditional courts bill the Secrecy Bill, the General Laws Amendment Bill, because all these laws taken together form a plan. And I'm sure that they're more in the pipeline. And the internet can help us tweet about them. But if you believe that the ANC or the government is not listening into your conversations now, is not having access to, your, to, your, to our emails and, and all those things now, then you're living in a different world to the one I do. But what I can say to you is that they're trying to make that legal and we have to stop them from making it legal because it's our duty to do that. Um, so, you know, I'm, 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 I'm an enlightenment person. I believe technology can be good and if it's used well. So, for me, I hate the fact that people can't speak English properly on, on Facebook. 
I'm talking about English native speakers. I'm not talking about people whose home language is not English. So when people have LOL, right? Uh, <laughs> I sent a message once to someone's mom, to someone saying, uh, sorry to hear your mom died, <laughs> LOL. Like, you don't, uh, and, and then, you know, like, laugh out loud. And after that, I never ever used one of those short things again. Um, so, to come back,